Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Delia O'Brien, and I'm the Small Ruminant Specialist at Virginia State University. Um, prior to that, I was in a similar position at Delaware State University where, where I did more research. My appointment right now is a lot of extension, is mostly extension, but back in Delaware, I did research on natural products. I had a SEER grant for natural products for parasite control, and also had a USDA grant for characterizing dewormer resistance on sheep and goat farms in the Mid-Atlantic. So today, I'm the last talk for this breakout session. And I'm, I guess, that, that talk between you and lunch, which is just <laughs> one hour long. So I'll try to make this quick. I do tend to talk a lot. You could talk a whole lot about parasites. <laughs> we could talk all day. So I'll, I'll try to be pretty fast. And that's why I titled my talk, Everything You Need to Know About Worms in 25 Minutes. So I'll try to be, be, I'll try to be short. I'll have to be if, you guys, if I want you guys to eat. Um, so let me see. So briefly, I'll be going over just some, there are four topics, some worms of control, um, the drugs that are available for treatment, um, the current status of dewormer resistance in the, in the US, and some sustainable integrated parasite management techniques um, that are now recommended. Got to get used to using the clicker. So for most of my talk, I'll be, I'll be the parasites that I'll be mentioning are actually internal parasites, how to manage those in sheep and goats. Sheep and goats are also affected by external parasites, but I think um, just about everyone would agree that most of the challenge do come from internal parasites, so that's why my talk will focus more on that. Um, the internal parasites that affect sheep and goats include nematodes, such as your barber pole worm, um, cestodes or tapeworms, and um, trematodes or flukes and they also include um, coccidial infections as well. And again, everyone would, I think everyone would agree that the most devastating and challenging parasite that we deal with in the sheep and goat industry is the Haemonchus contortus. It's also known as the barbell pole worm or the wire worm, and it's so devastating because it's a blood-sucking parasite. It has a short life cycle, and adult females can lay anywhere up to, to 10,000 eggs per day, so they're highly prolific. Symptoms of barber pole worm infection usually in, include anemia and edema due to blood loss and um, plasma protein loss, and it also includes um, weight loss and sudden death. Um, sometimes we don't even know that there's an infection until we go out there and find an animal dead. Um, some other parasites of importance, um, we've got Teledorsasia and Trichostrongylus, and these are more an additive effect in mixed parasite infections with symptoms including ill thrift, poor appetite, and scouring, which is not usually found with just uh, mainly a barber pole worm infection. Tapeworm infections tend not to tend to be non-pathogenic, especially in more mature animals, um, and they, are, they do tend to be less of a problem than the intestinal parasites were mentioned on the previous page. Um, coccidial infections can be very problematic as well. Um, they're problematic especially in young animals during stressful times, and especially in areas or on farm operations where sanitation um, isn't maintained, good sanitation isn't maintained. The meningeal worm or brain worm can also be problematic in certain parts of the US. This is a parasite of the white-tailed deer, and sheep and goats are dead-end hosts, and it causes neuromuscular symptoms when they do get infected. So in order to, to know how to best control these parasites, we have to understand the typical life cycle of these stomach worms, um, such as a barber pole worm. So adult male and female inside the gut of these animals, they mate, the female lays eggs, it's passed on to pasture in manure. If conditions are right on those pasture, that is moisture and warmth, then these eggs are gonna hatch and they're gonna develop into an infective larvae that moves up and down a blade of grass. They're ingested by the sheep again. They further their development to adults, mate, the cycle just continues on pasture. 
Um, what's important to note too, or what makes them more problematic, is the ability that these gastrointestinal nematodes have to go to do, um, of during the winter to go into dormancy, hypobiosis. So they can actually survive the winter inside these animals and wait until spring to reinfect pastures. And this typically coincides with what, with what um, lambing and kidding on pasture. All right, so it's very um, important to know that. For years, we've depended on drugs to treat these worms. In the US, we have three classes of dewormers that are available, the benzimidazoles, nicotinic agonists, and macrocyclic lactones. All right, what are, what's the problem that we're having with these drugs now? Resistance is a big issue that, that we're having. In other parts of the world, there are more classes available. The amino acetonitrile derivative, um, Zolvix, is, a, is available and that can be used to treat um, animals with worms that are resistant to these three classes. And um, spiroindole or StarTech is also available. However, five years after introduction of Zolvix, there's been reports of resistance on farms. So resistance is inevitable, all right? The goal of any parasite management um, program is to limit the exposure of these animals to the worms and to use what we have, use the drugs that we have more efficiently to prolong efficacy on farms. So surveys of dewormer resistance on U.S. farms have shown that a lot of farms, um, most farms, have resistance to two out of three of those classes that were mentioned. All right, in two studies conducted in the U.S., let me make sure I'm pointing to the right one. Okay, didn't see it there first. So two studies that were conducted from 2007 to 2009 in on sheep and goat farms in the mid-Atlantic and in the southern U.S. showed that just about all farms had resistance to benzimidazole dr drugs. There were many that had, or most had, resistance to ivermectin and many to cydectin and levamisol. A more recent study funded by the American Sheep Industry looking at sheep farms in Maryland, Virginia, and Georgia showed that all farms had resistance to benzimidazoles, most to ivermectin and cydectin, and some having resistance to levamisol. So as you can see from these figures, Dewormer resistance is quite critical in many areas. So we now need to adapt more sustainable techniques for parasite control on farms. Those surveys were conducted by determining resistance by one of two tests, fecal egg count reduction test or the larval development assay. And there are pros and cons of, of doing either test, the fecal egg count reduction test. You can probably, you could learn how to do fecal egg counts and do it yourself on your farm. It does take some, some labor, however. I always recommend doing a larval development assay. It's one pool fecal sample from at least 10 animals with FAMACHA scores greater than three. It's one test you submit to the University of Georgia and you have your results for all classes of dewormers. So I think that it costs $450 and producers complain. We've had studies where we've you know, cost shared and we still get complaints. Some producers step back and don't want to do it and we've ended up having to pay for the whole thing. But I think that's pretty cheap to know the status of resistance on your farm and what dewormers you should be um, using. It is advised that resistance be done every two to three years on farms so you know what's, what's happening in your worm population. So as I said earlier, resistance has reached a critical point on most U.S. farms. And so we have to take a more sustainable, integrated approach to parasite control. And a lot of these, you've, you've, you've heard some of these things mentioned from Nancy and Charlotte this morning. Um, in the non-chemical control, including pasture and grazing management, genetic selection, nutrition, the use of herbal dewormers, um, copper oxide wire particle, condensed tannins, and others. And if these fails, if these techniques fail, 
and most of the times you're going to need to deworm animals on your farm, then having a dewormer, using a dewormer in a more responsible manner in targeted selective treatment is what is recommended now on most farms. So targeted, targeted selected treatment simply means deworming those animals that, only those animals that require treatment. How many folks in here are sheep producers? Sheep or, and or goat producers? Are you using this on your farm? Using your famacha, using these tools? tools? That's what every farmer should be use, using on their farm to control parasites. This technique slows down resistance by increasing refugia, and refugia is just a number of, of worms on your farm that are left in refuge from the drugs. You're, di you're di basically diluting out the worm population and making more susceptible worms be on your pasture. It also helps in identifying animals that are susceptible or not. So you could call base on this and get rid of animals that are not as resistant um, to parasites. The two tools that we have developed is the FOMACHA system and the five-point check. The FOMACHA system just simply rates an animal um, on a scale of one to five for its anemia, with one being white and healthy, and with one being red and healthy, and five being pale and severely anemic. The five-point check, it actually, it actually um, includes the anemia as well as some other variables and looks at the overall animal in a holistic approach. So whereas the anemia or the FOMACHA score just looks at anemia based on the barber pole worm infection, the five-point check takes into account every other parasite that's on there. So you should be using this on farm to manage parasites. Should fecal egg counts be used to, deworming, to deworm animals? Folks that have sheep and goats, have you used fecal egg counts to deworm? In what cases? Every time? Mm -hmm. no. Well, I mean, I usually run a fecal egg count before I treat them mm -hmm. to make sure that that's what the problem is. Because a lot of times, it may not be the nematode problem, but a coccidia problem, and if you just randomly do one, you know, Exactly. Exactly. So I hope most people heard. Eh? So what Charlotte was saying is that she typically does it just to make sure it's, it's, it's internal parasites. Um, or rather that it is a nematode. nematode problem and not a coccidia problem. So she does run it too. Um, but typically in most cases, what we recommended is to use the five point check and for matcha scores to determine need for deworming. deworming. Fecal egg counts be used to deworm? In most cases, no. A lot of producers aren't going to take fecal egg counts behind checking for matcha scores, <laughs> and so um, you never do that. But, but fecal egg counts are best for monitoring the rate of pasture contamination, determining drug resistance, um, as mentioned before, and also for culling animals. In cases where individual fecal egg counts are extremely high though, then if you do have a chance to do it and it's high, then deworm those animals. And why is that? Why would you deworm anyone that you see? If you do a fecal egg count and you, you see a few that are high, even though they might have, by FOMACHA you would not deworm them, but by fecal egg count they have a very high load. Why would you deworm those animals? If their formatcha looks good and their fecal egg counts are high. Oh, exactly, so that they don't spread this on pasture for your more susceptible animals. Mm -hmm. You're resilient. That goes into resilient versus resistant. All right, and if you're going to wait, if you're going to use the formatcha and five point system to deworm animals, then you've got to make sure that when you do administer a drug, then it's going to be pretty effective. All right, part of the resistant issue we have, we, we have now, it's due to overuse of drugs. It used to be recommended that you deworm every four to six weeks, and also from the misuse of drugs, underdosing animals, um, not giving that correct, correct dose. So if you have to deworm animals, you've got to make sure that you do what you can to increase that drug efficacy. So making sure that you weigh before treatment. Um, 
if you have access to a scale, great. If you don't, your neighbor has, they maybe weigh the heaviest animals in that group. So you at least have an idea and you're not weighing on an average and underdose some animals. Um, if you don't have access to a scale, I recommend using a weight tip because at least an estimate is better than, than, than nothing. Um, drenching correctly. We've all been spit in the face from incorrect drenching by goats, <laughs> right? If you don't drench them correctly, it'll come right back on your, in, in your face. And we did that with ginger one year, and ginger burns. <laughs> um, ginger burns. And so making sure that you have a dosing syringe that has a long metal nozzle that goes back over the tongue and back towards the back of the mouth. It's been found that restricting feed for 24 hours increases drug efficacy too. It slows the gut motility down and leaves the drug in contact with the worms longer. Repeat dosing 12 hours apart. So that's two full doses, 12 hours apart, special with benzimidazole drugs, has been shown to, to increase that efficacy. What's now being recommended is combination dewormers. Everyone who has sheep, who raised sheep and goats right now, have you heard that? Are you aware of combination dewormers to treat your animals? Um, so dewormers, it is now the recommendation that you give dewormers in combination for an additive effect. It increases the efficacy, um, overall efficacy, and it also increases refugia compared to just using one drug um, at a time. And there are farms, uh, we, I had a farm in, oh my gosh, already. Mm -hmm. I had a farm, in, I have a, a farm in Virginia where I'm from and the resistance status is so severe that combination dewormers aren't even effective on that, on that farm. The percent reduction is, is pretty low even combining all three. And so the recommendation has been combining an alternative treatment such as copper oxide wire particle with one of those drugs because there are farms where that is possible. Um, pasture management, some of that has been mentioned today. There are different strategies that you could use for good pasture management. Rotational grazing, maintaining low stocking rates, multi-species grazing. Um, all of these, I think, have been mentioned by Nancy and Charlotte um, to some extent this morning. And just in case we don't get to anything right here in this presentation, ATRA has a lot of publications on there that on the table right up front that goes into a lot more depth on these topics, all right? So genetic selection, every producer should be using good pasture management and genetic selection to control worms on their farm. Um, the ability to regulate worms is under genetic control and resistance is the ability of their animal to limit infection, whereas resilience is the ability of animals to withstand infection. And this is why in addition to, to FAMACHA scores, it's still good to get an idea of what your fecal egg counts are because FAMACHA scores will just tell you if they have clinical symptoms um, and if th that need to deworm. A fecal egg count will give you a little bit more information. Are they resistant or are they resilient? So you, you, it is wise to do both on most farms if it's possible. There are some breeds that are more resistant than others. However, there are individuals within every breed that have resistance. And so you, should, you, sh you, you shouldn't just discount an animal because it's a boar. <laughs> um, resist resistant dams and sires will most likely produce resistant offspring. So you want to keep around those animals that you, you don't have to you know, deworm multiple times throughout the year. I usually tell folks, if you're deworming animals three, four times a year, then you might need to get rid of them, all right? And I get a lot of funny faces because a lot of times those animals tend to be pets, a lot of <laughs> loved ones, special ones. The sire or male contributes 50% to the flock genetics. So more money should be spent on that animal and you should really be purchasing a male that has some data on him. All right, whether it's EPVs or, or you know, they've been in a performance test, choose a male that has some data on him. And again, finally, just remember that 80-20 rule. 20% 20 of the flock shed 80% of the worm in a flock or herd. Identifying those and culling them will go a long way to helping you in parasite control on your farm. This is down to one minute now. 
nutrition, ensuring that animals are receiving good nutrition and are fed a balanced ration with proper mineral supplementation will aid in parasite control. Good nutrition increases immunity. So if you're feeding them right, that will help you too in managing, managing parasites, even in animals that are most susceptible. In your lactating females, in your young animals, if they're fed right, then they'll deal better with parasites. I can't tell you how many times I've been to farms and these animals have nothing to graze out there and a producer's looking at me like, why am I having this parasite problem or so, you know, so much parasite problems. Herbal dewormers. I don't know how many people in here are, have used herbal, herbal dewormers. Um, what I can say is that there's a lot of anecdotal evidence that herbal dewormers work, but there's a lot, lack of scientific support. There's a lack of scientific support there, um, and so if you're using it, what it might do is help to provide a boost in immunity, like pumpkin seeds have a high protein content. Better nutrition is gonna increase immunity. If you're using it, and you think that it's, it's at a, you know, serving a benefit, then continue. It's working in your holistic approach on your farm. But if you've got an animal with a FAMACHA score of four or five, it should never be, you know, a, a, a herbal product should never be used to treat that animal. So they can be used in an integrated approach, but never by itself, okay? Copper oxide wire particles, um, Copper is important, again, for immune function. They're com commercially available to alleviate copper deficiency, and research has shown that, that low doses of these are effective in controlling the barber pole worm in sheep and goats, and they can be included. As I mentioned before, if, all, if resistance on your farm is so low that even a combination treatment is not effective, combining a drug with copper oxide wire particle could be effective in, in treating your animals. Condensed tannins. I think Charlotte mentioned this. They've had plenty of success um, with Cerecia lespidiza fed, um, whether grazed, fed as a hay or pellets. It's been effective in controlling the barber pole worm and also in controlling coccidia on farms as well. Thought it would be interesting to measure that what holds promise for US producers is the fungi, Dodentonia flagrans. Um, this fungi, when fed to animals, it survives the digestive tract, and when it's, um, when it's on the pasture, it germinates and basically restricts the development of parasite larvae. This, I've been told, will be available to US producers in the near future, and so this will be another option for parasite control on farms. Okay, final thoughts. Uh -huh. So what research has shown is barber pole worm is thriving in more areas than just the southeastern US. So more and more states are having issues with barber pole worm. And resistance has reached a critical limit that we can no longer depend on drugs to, to control parasites on our farm. A more holistic, integrated um, management protocol is required. So work with your veterinarians to, to develop, you know, test for resistance and work with your, your veterinarians to develop a parasite control that program that works for your system. Every farm is different. Every single farm is different. And everyone should be doing pasture management and genetic selection on their farms, right? Okay. All right, and here are some websites, wormx.info, excellent site for everything parasites, Atra, some very good publications, and sheepandgoat.com as well. So I'm not sure if there's any questions. I feel like I just speed raced through that. Yeah. <laughs>